We are moving along in the book of Acts, and we are now into Acts chapter 3. So today we're starting a new chapter in Acts. We've now moved out of Acts chapter 2. We're now entering into Acts 3. In Acts chapter 2, the major event that we were focused on that was happening was the Holy Spirit being poured out on the day of Pentecost. And then the rest of the chapter, almost the rest of the chapter, is Peter preaching a sermon to explain what God is up to or was up to through that event. Holy Spirit was poured out, Peter's explaining it and letting people know, centering it all around Jesus Christ. Now we're moving into Acts chapter 3, and the layout is pretty similar. We've got an, a healing event that takes place where we have a lame man being healed by Peter and John, That's a, a beggar that's at the temple gates. And then the rest of the chapter is going to be devoted to pr Peter preaching another sermon that's explaining the details of what was going on, why this happened, and how this all centers around Jesus. Similar layout, similar flow. So Luke ended chapter 2 with a very brief description of what the early church looked like. This is sort of like sandwiched in between what I had just mentioned. He talks about how the early church was forming around a couple of major main priorities. Devotion to biblical teaching, prayer, fellowshipping together, eating together, sacrificially serving with compassion, and a reliance on the Holy Spirit. So now he has told us what the early church looked like. He now opens chapter 3, showing us how some of this is beginning to manifest. Really, the rest of Acts is going to be sort of explaining to us how the Holy Spirit, the reliance on the Holy Spirit, and the outpouring impacted this new community of, uh, of, of Jesus followers. So when we see chapter 3 opening, we're going to see some important things happen here as the healing of the lame man, lame man shows us that we're going to see right away that the early church had a commitment to prayer. And this is what Luke talked about in uh, chapter 2. But we're going to see it lived out now. We're going to see the early church having a commitment to compassion. Luke talked about it, and now we're going to see it lived out. We're going to see how Luke talked about the early church's reliance on the Holy Spirit. Now it's going to happen. The early church also has a central primary focus on Jesus, on the name of Jesus, and centering everything that they do around Jesus. And we're also going to see how Luke points out that what the early church does, who they are, how they operate, how they live, has a tendency to disturb and disrupt the religious institutions of the day. And we're going to see that play out in what happens here, but that's going to be in chapter 4 when we get there in 2024. Just kidding. We'll get there sooner. This morning, we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. And Sinneret read the entire story, verses 1 through 10. But I'm breaking apart the story of the lame man being healed into two parts. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 5 this morning, which is sort of the lead up. The healing's not going to quite happen, but we're sort of, sort of seeing what's happening as we get to the healing. We're going to focus on the first two bullet points of the list I just gave you. In verses 1 through 5, Luke is highlighting the early church's commitment to prayer and the early church's commitment to compassion. Now, I would imagine that if I pulled everybody in this room, everyone would agree that, is, that prayer and compassion are important, vital aspects of being a Christian— and participating in the life of the church. Is everybody in agreement with me on that? That prayer and compassion are really, really important. I don't think that's controversial for me to make that statement. But interesting enough, we're seeing today in American Christianity sort of a war take place between prayer and compassion. We have moved ourselves, and I'm talking very generalized, very stereotypical right now, but we have moved ourselves into two different camps. We either identify as a Christian who prioritizes prayer, or we identify as a Christian who prioritizes compassion. So let me explain. Prayer is one of the primary ways that you and I grow in our love of God and our intimate connection to Him. And 
as I move forward, I facilitated our communion service today in a very particular way to go along with what I'm going to be preaching about and talking about as I talk about our vertical relationship with God and the horizontal relationship that we have to other people. So prayer is this foundational element that helps us to grow in and develop our vertical relationship with God. It's about me and, and me and the Lord here. I am spending time being with God. I am spending time immersed in his presence. Compassion is one of the primary ways that you and I show love and concern for neighbor, the people around us. Think of this as the foundational element that develops our horizontal connection, not just to others, but a horizontal connection to God as we see God in other people. God's love being displayed and his image bearer in other people. Now, some people in some churches love to emphasize prayer and any other spiritual practice that is connected to prayer that helps us develop and grow in this vertical relationship. We like to be very strong in this area. We have a deep identity and a deep reputation in this area. Maybe our church holds a lot of vibrant prayer meetings. Our church has a lot of strong discipleship happening around the topic of prayer and teaching people to pray, and they spend a lots of time in prayer, long amounts of time at the altar. They do extended worship services, doing more of a singing form of prayer. They highlight a devotional reading of scripture that helps us prayerfully connect to God through scripture. So in the end, they see that this vertical relationship with God, this this calling to prayer as super important, and it takes up a lot of time and it takes up a lot of energy, and they only dabble, or we only dabble in the horizontal aspect of compassion. Our earnest desire and pursuit of wanting to be connected with God and helping others be connected with God can take up so much space in our life and so much space in our communal life together that little is being done, not nothing, but more little is being done to demonstrate compassion to those that are in need around us. So that's one group of people or group of churches. On the other hand, there's some people and there are some churches who love to emphasize the work of compassion and any other spiritual gift or practice that enhances our love of neighbor, our service of neighbor, not just loving God through prayer, but loving God through loving people, doing things for God, especially when it comes to showing care to the vulnerable, the weak, the needy, and the hurting. So we that have a primary identity around Compassion is we are focused mainly on this horizontal aspect. We have a deep identity to this and a reputation to this. Maybe we run soup kitchens, homeless shelters. We fight for justice and fairness for the oppressed. Uh, we are caring for the orphan, the outcast, tending to the needs of the victimized, starting specialized nonprofits, donating our money and our resources, fighting for money and resources for people who are struggling to survive. And we see this as our primary focus and calling as a Christian to be all about the horizontal, to be only about caring and serving and doing the work of, 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 of love for, of Christ for people, and we only dabble in the vertical. We really aren't spending much time in prayer. We aren't really spending much time in cultivating that greater dependency upon God, that trust in God through intercession, worship, and other practices. It's like, in a way, the American church has broken in this area. And we have taken the advice of Solomon and we have taken the great commandment and we've decided to split it in half and just cut that baby down the middle and say some of us are going to focus on loving God, doing the vertical, and some of us are going to focus on loving others, doing the compassion stuff. But it's really going to be nothing that we have to all do holistically together. So we are in different camps and we choose our church based upon which one we value and which one we prioritize and which one we are comfortable with. I want to go to a church that's really meeting the needs of the, the neighborhood and meeting the needs of people. So I'm really, that's a big marker for me. I want to go to that. And that's a big decision on why we choose where we worship. Man, I really need to go to a church that's like spiritually vibrant and there's like a really strong worship and prayer element going on and I need I need to be around people that are like hungry and seeking the Holy Spirit and passionate about God so that's going to be a main driver in why I choose what I choose
Here in our passage in verse 1 through 5, we see the early followers of Jesus making a commitment to both prayer and making a commitment to compassion. There are people that encompasses and values and prioritizes the entire great commandment. And uh, how many of us know what the great commandment is? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So while nobody here would disagree that prayer and compassion are vital foundational aspects of the Christian faith, why is it that it seems that we have taken sides against each other, creating an unhealthy tension, a conflict, an adversarial relationship with one another around the relationship of these two? Because not only do we gravitate to one over the other, we tend to look down our nose at the, at the one who's valuing the other. They're not really doing what God's called them to do because you're supposed to be doing what we're doing over here. This is a very oversimplified caricature that I'm painting right now. But on one side, we're going to have Christians who think the number one priority in life is to love God and to get other people to love him too. Focusing on evangelism, outreach, preaching the gospel message and getting other people into a faithful devotional life with God. On the other hand, we have other Christians who think the number one priority in life is to just love people, serve people, meet the needs of people, uh, and uh, care for people, and that is what we need to be doing as followers of Jesus. And in doing so, we've created warring factions of people who say, I value this, no, no, I value that, and we look at each other, and we don't value each other. Each side saying, Maybe not saying it out loud, but at least thinking it, that they're a better follower of Jesus. Allowing pride, arrogance, and fruits of the flesh to come into this dynamic between prayer and compassion. Let's reread our first five verses again of, this, of today. It says, One day Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter and John looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from him. So here in our passage, the verses open up with Peter and John on their way to daily prayer at the temple. And I believe that prayer at the temple was held two or three times a day, and we all are rejoicing, saying, yes, the early followers of Jesus and the disciples, they were dedicating themselves to prayer because they were making their way to the temple to pray. Amen. Glory to God. We love prayer. But also here in our passage, we have Peter and John stopping to recognize, acknowledge, and as we are going to see next week, minister and be compassionate to this lame beggar. So yes, the disciples and the apostles and the early church, they were dedicated to compassion. They were willing to look at the needs of those suffering around them and meet those needs, not ignore them, not walk by, by them, but actually pay attention and do something tangible to meet the needs of those that were suffering. Here in the first couple verses of Acts 3, Luke is presenting to us at the beginning of the journey of the early church a people who were holistically living out the great commandment of loving God and loving neighbor. And as I would say, and as I have said, it seems that the American church has broken somehow. It seems like some of us are trying to swim with just our arms, or some of us are trying to swim with just our legs. And the million-dollar question that we should be thinking about and looking at when it comes to looking at the broken landscape of who we are and what we've become to say, what does it look like to have and to hold both a deep commitment to prayer and a deep commitment to compassion and to practically live that out as followers of Jesus today? To not just be people who only mainly value prayer and dabble a little bit in compassion, or to be a people that only value compassion and acts of love and service and then just dabble weekly in prayer, what does it mean and what does it look like for us to be a people who vibrantly and passionately value both and participate in both? James says it this way, 
Faith without works is what? Dead. We need faith. We need works. We need loving God. We need doing for God. It's a both and. It all happens. So when it comes to figuring this out and growing in our relationship with the Lord and becoming more mature followers of Jesus, does this practically look like you and I creating an Excel spreadsheet that just, and then we just begin to input data to show how much time we're spending in prayer versus how much time we're doing works of compassion, and then making sure our weeks, our days, our months, everything sort of has equal attention given to it. Is that the way forward? Some of you are like super organized people, and you're like, yes, let's do it. Let's get that spreadsheet together, and let's record every action that we make in life. And does it go into the prayer category? Does it go into the compassion category? And let's make it as equal as we can make them. I'm here to say that I don't think that's the way forward for us today. I don't think that you and I need to be charting for every hour we spend in prayer, we need to be doing an hour of compassionate work. What I would offer this morning is that our way forward is to learn and to develop a greater dependence on the Holy Spirit. The way we need to move forward, and once again, Luke is writing to us a book in Acts that is centered around the Holy Spirit. And what he is demonstrating to you and I is a people who were comfortable with and listening to and trying to walk in, in step with what the Holy Spirit was up to. So when we look at the life and ministry of Jesus, this is where it starts for us because this is the best example that you and I have of watching and looking into the life of somebody who is completely dedicated to and sold out to embodying the fullness of the great commandment through a reliance on the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the perfect model for you and I to look at, to understand what it means to be people of prayer and people of compassion simultaneously. There is nothing in the Gospels that is going to give you and I a spreadsheet that shows how much time Jesus dedicated to prayer and how much time Jesus dedicated to compassion. I don't even think if we broke it down, I don't even know if someone's done this work, but can we find tangible data that tells us that Jesus was more about prayer than he was about compassion, or Jesus was more about compassion than he was about prayer? What we find in the Gospels is we find somebody who was living his life intuitively. Somebody who, was, who had a perfectly developed instinct for the Holy Spirit. Somebody who was so in tune with the will of the Father and being obedient to what God wanted to see happen at any given time day opportunity that Jesus was able to appropriately and correctly respond and give what was needed to be given in that moment. Isn't that beautiful? That Jesus was so in step with the Holy Spirit, so in tune, and you're like, well, Jeremy, that's easy because he, you know, he's the triune God, and that's like he's got a leg up on us. Yes, he does have a leg up on us in this area. But Jesus, he just always seemed to know what was right to do in any given situation. He leaned into prayer when he needed to lean into prayer. He leaned into compassion whenever he needed to lean into compassion. His responses, what Jesus did, it was always appropriate and it was always spot on. I look at Mark chapter 1 and in Mark chapter 1, Jesus is spending a lot of time in this chapter doing compassion. Mark is recording that Jesus is going around and he's healing the sick. He's casting out demons. He's caring for people. He's doing all of this work. And it says that he does all of this well past sundown into the evening after the sun has set. Mark then goes on to record that Jesus with, with, he withdrew early in the following morning to a solitary place where he prayed. The disciples come looking for Jesus, frantically saying, let's go, get back to town. The crowds have arrived again. They're at the same houses. Like, there's more people now. We got to get the compassion train rolling all over again. 
And Jesus says, eh, let's go to another town. I got to preach over there. The disciples are like, what? They didn't even know that he had left to pray. So you've got this, you've got these two different, like, viewpoints. You've got Jesus, who's, like, really in tune with what needs to happen. He's doing compassion. He knows when he's doing compassion. He knows when he needs to pray. He knows when he needs to withdraw. And then he knows where he needs to go next. You've got the disciples not knowing what to do, sort of paying attention to other markers, other indicators, and trying to convince Jesus to do what they think that he should do. And Jesus is like, ah, I'm not listening to you guys. So you got Jesus in step, you got the disciples out of step. At the end of his life, Jesus is going to go to the cross, which is the most sacrificial act of compassion that the world has ever seen displayed. But before he goes to the cross, he goes to the garden, and he spends time in prayer seeking the, seeking the will of the Father. It's as if he knew that the most sacrificially compassionate act of his life if he was going to be able to go through with it, required him to be intimately connected to the Father. What did the disciples do? Well, they slept while Jesus prayed, and they scattered when Jesus was pouring his life out with the greatest act of compassion. This is what we see happening in the the Gospels. We see a Jesus completely in tune with the Father, and with the will of the Father, and we see the disciples sort of bewildered and always wondering what's going on. But now we are in Acts, and we have the Holy Spirit being poured out in Acts chapter 2. And we see a completely different reaction and display from our disciples now. Because the disciples are now modeling what Jesus was modeling in the Gospels. They are now being led by the Spirit into all things prayer and into all things compassion, the way Jesus was being uh, um, led into those things. And once again, what is the difference here? The difference is the Holy Spirit. Which is why the way that we need to move forward into understanding our role within the relationship of prayer and compassion is to be people of the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit, dependent on the Holy Spirit, consumed with the Spirit, and comfortable with the Spirit. Peter and John were dedicated to prayer. They would go to the temple every day to pray. But they were also sensitive enough to know that in this specific encounter, the Spirit was asking of them to stop and to be compassionate. They thought they were on their way to develop their vertical relationship with God. The Holy Spirit said, nope, I'm stopping you there. I'm going to reorient your expectations and say, this is a moment for you to extend compassion and to show love to your fellow man. Because it would have been easy for Peter and John to be like, well, Hello there, Mr. Lame Beggar. I see you there. You're there every day. I'm going to the temple every day to pray. I'll pray for you and just walk on to prayer, right? Also could be where never make it to prayer because there's always people begging at the temple gate. And I never get to prayer because I'm always stopping to talk with, pray for, comfort, you know, do whatever it is to meet the tangible needs of those at the temple gate. So like in this interesting story, it's like, Trying to, like, figure out the million-dollar question of here is, like, when do I go into the temple and when do I stop at the temple gate? And I think a lot of us are trying to live out our lives at this very crux, this very moment, to say, what am I supposed to be about? Am I supposed to be about prayer or am I supposed to be about compassion? Without a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit, and without developing a comfort and a familiarity with how the Holy Spirit leads, and without us having a relationship with the Holy Spirit, without us having a relationship with the Holy Spirit, we tend to look like the disciples in the Gospels. Yes, we value prayer. Yes, we value compassion. But we don't know how to become in sync with what God is really up to in the world. And so maybe we're banging the prayer drum when God is asking us to be compassionate. Or maybe we're banging the compassion drum when the moment that we're in calls for prayer. So if what I'm saying is true, I think I'm being true here. The most important thing isn't that you and I can demonstrate how good we are at prayer or how good we are at compassion. The most important thing that we can be up to is trying to figure out what is God wanting, what does this moment call for, and how do I appropriately respond in a way that pleases the Heavenly Father. Abraham Maslow famously stated, if all you have is a hammer, 
you tend to see every problem as a nail. How many of you have heard that statement before? If all you, see is a, if all you have is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. If all you and I do is emphasize prayer, we are going to see prayer as the solution to every problem that we come across. And if all you and I do is emphasize compassion, then we are going to see acts of mercy as the solution to every problem that we come across. The secret, the real secret, is for us to learn how to be in step with God, discovering how to act and respond in ways that are faithful and obedient to Him. So the question isn't, am I supposed to pray now? The question isn't, is, am I supposed to be compassionate now? The question is, Lord, show me your will. Speak to me, Lord. Guide me. So many times we're too busy making our own plans, building our own kingdoms, doing our own stuff. And we think that we're doing what God wants us to do because it's in the realm of prayer or it's in the realm of compassion. But we really quite don't know what God is really up to and asking of us in that moment. Some of us probably gravitate to prayer more than compassion because maybe we just want to avoid sacrifice. Some of us maybe gravitate to compassion because we like to trust ourselves more than we like to trust God. And it actually is a better fit for us because we like to take things into our own hands. So becoming a compassionate person sort of just fits our nature better. Some of us gravitate to prayer because we are just burned out of trying so hard and feeling like our efforts haven't really made much of a difference. So, you know, I'm just going to focus on prayer now. Some of us gravitate to compassion because maybe prayer doesn't seem to have worked in the past. In the end, we can't rely on our own reasoning and our own logic in these matters. Our leaning into prayer, our leaning into compassion has to be done from a posture of trying to do our best to listen to, respond, and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in the moment that we are living in. Prayer isn't bad. Compassion isn't bad. I'm just saying that sometimes our timing and our reasoning might be off. And I'm not saying that this is a zero-sum activity. Hear me on this. Everything in life doesn't require only prayer or only compassion. And we're just trying to navigate and figure out which one are we supposed to do for that. That's too simplistic. Please don't hear me trying to advocate for that. It's not just one or the other. We look at what's happening in Hawaii right now and the devastation that's happening across Uh, as homes are being burned, uh, people's lives are being lost. And the answer isn't only, well, we just need to pray. And the answer isn't only, well, we need to like serve people and help people rebuild their lives and be compassionate. The answer is we need prayer and compassion working simultaneously in this moment. But the question then becomes, what are we supposed to do individually? What, is, what emphasis are we, when it like, like it, it can get a little bit murky trying to figure it out. And that's where we have to say, God, We are people of the great commandment. We are people that value prayer. We are people that value compassion. Lead us and guide us in what is appropriate for us in this way forward. Sometimes proximity in in and of itself makes a big difference, right? I wish I could give us all the answers. I wish I could give us a way forward to say this is what we should be looking for in our current situations. It feels sort of like vague for me to just say to be in step with the Spirit. But I want us to be encouraged to say that we need to develop a muscle that learns how to do this and to be this person, which means trial and error a lot of times. We're going to have to step out and like pay attention to like dreams or, or thoughts or uh, things that other people come our way and be like, I think that's the Holy Spirit at work. I think the Holy Spirit is trying to talk to me through that dream. I think the Holy Spirit is trying to talk to me through that passage of Scripture that I just read. I think the Holy Spirit is trying to talk to me through that friend that just said something to me. I think the Holy Spirit is trying to talk to me through uh, that thought that just dropped into my mind. And like, start to like practice and act on those things and say, well, if this is the Holy Spirit, I'm going to step out and try it and see what happens. But sometimes we're just so afraid that we just don't even do anything and we don't develop that muscle to begin to learn and understand what's a counterfeit thing going on here versus what's the real thing that the Holy Spirit's doing here. This is all part of our maturing and our growth process. And what the devil wants to do is to keep you and I from ever attempting to live life in the Spirit. The devil is completely content for you to claim Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but to not live in the Spirit. 
Because then you're just of no, your life doesn't really matter here on this earth for kingdom work. You've just identified yourself by name. So the final thing I want us to think about and consider as I wrap up here is why are we polarized around this? Why are we in a place where some of us overvalue prayer and some of us overvalue compassion? And I want you and I to think and consider that maybe the polarization that we are experiencing in our world, in our culture, specifically the political polarization that we're experiencing, is dividing us along these lines. I find it interesting that Christian conservatives frequently favor prayer and the emphasis on the vertical relationship with God as the priority and as the dominant for the life Uh, for for life, for the Christian life. Isn't it interesting that Christian progressives frequently favor compassion and the emphasis of social justice and on acts of mercy? Is this just a coincidence, or is there some causation in this? Have you and I been caught up into a propaganda machine that causes us to value one over the other and then to turn on the other side. Because you and I are living in a world where Republicans and Democrats do not get along. They really don't like each other and their vision for the way forward in life is completely different and they think that they're right and the other person is wrong. And maybe, just maybe, this has leaked into the church And it has divided us along the lines of prayer and compassion with those of us that are tending to lean a little bit more conservative favoring prayer, those of us that are tending to lean a little bit more progressive favoring compassion, and there's no real coincidence to it. But we've been caught up into something that is not healthy, is not biblical, and not scriptural. You see, as we go through the book of Acts, the way the early church operates is they disrupt and disturb what's going on in society. Why is it that our churches find a way to be at peace with what's going on in society? There might be something wrong here. Maybe we're not dividing ourselves around prayer and compassion, but maybe we're truly dividing ourselves around political lines and cultural lines. I think we need to stop and intently evaluate who we are, our leanings, and our ideologies. Why do we value? Why do we prioritize what we prioritize? Why do we think what we think? Why do we gravitate to certain scriptures? Why do we do what we do? Are we being led truly by the Spirit? Can we honestly say that? That you and I, we feel like that we are doing what we're doing and we're emphasizing what we're emphasizing because we know and can confidently say, this is what the Spirit has led me into? Or are we being driven somehow, without even realizing it, by a political message or some form of propaganda? You see, the political system here in our country is being used right now to divide us. It's being used to teach us that we should demonize each other and we should be suspicious of one another and it is our job to believe the worst in the person that thinks differently than we do politically and culturally. We are living with ongoing outrage, anger, and divisiveness towards one another instead of being angry and outraged at people in power. And this is purposefully, in my mind, purposefully formed to keep those in power, holding that power, wanting us to fight with each other versus hold them accountable for what they are doing. The system would rather us remain at odds with each other instead of being unified so that we can demand real change and hold real accountability for our elected officials and the others that are buying their influence and their control of our country with money. So is it possible? Is it just possible that you and I have been sucked into a vortex of hostility? We have been trained up 
in the art of knowing how to other people. And our wiring and who we are is playing itself out along the lines of prayer and compassion within, our body, within the body of Christ. In this environment of bickering, in this environment of fighting, in this environment of elitism, in this environment of wanting and searching to have the moral and spiritual high ground where one group gets to wave the banner and say, we're doing it right, or the other group gets to wave the banner and say, we're doing it right, maybe we need to pause here in the church and ask ourselves, should we be operating differently? Because in the political world, where some are saying we're right because we're Republican and we're right because we're Democrat, why are we allowing that to influence the life of the church where we now say we're right because we focus on prayer and we're right because we focus on compassion? We need to find a way that moves us forward differently, that moves us forward united and moves us forward holistically. Might I offer that it's life in the Spirit. It's about becoming people of the Spirit where we learn where prayer and compassion go hand in hand and it doesn't become a dividing line for us and we don't become tribal over it because maybe you and I have made the lines a little bit too rigid and the whole reason why we have separated prayer and compassion into two separate categories is just completely a false dichotomy in and of itself anyway because maybe, just maybe, prayer is an aspect of compassion and maybe, just maybe, the work of compassion can be a prayerful activity Maybe we're missing the mark because what we really need to recover is to figure out what it means to be the people of God and not the people of America. Peter and John were on their way to prayer. And the Holy Spirit said, no, you're not going to walk by this time. You're not going to just go to prayer, but you are going to stop and you are going to be compassionate in this moment. Sort of reminds me of the story of the Good Samaritan where maybe the priest who sort of skirted on by and went on to whatever priestly duties he needed to do, whatever prayerful duties he needed to go do, the Samaritan stopped and said, no, this isn't a moment that calls for prayer. This is a moment that calls for compassion. Many times, you and I maybe just want to jump into action. And we think that every encounter we have is about service, kindness, and acts of mercy. And we're not listening to the Holy Spirit who's maybe wanting to stop us to draw us into prayer. This Thursday night, we're going to Argyle Night Market. And I would love for you to join me. And I would categorize what we are going to do at Argyle Night Market as more of acts of compassion and service. We're there to, like, make kids smile. We're there to give things away. We're there to give people hope through a tangible expression of love and service to our community. But maybe, just maybe, in the midst of us doing that, the Holy Spirit is going to arrest our hearts and say, you should pray with this person. What would it look like for us to be people of the Spirit to say, you know what, I'm going to step out because I feel like the Holy Spirit's asking me if this person would like to pray. And instead of me just only being about the work of compassion because that's what we came here for, I'm going to be like Peter and John who stopped and arranged, rearranged their expectation and said, oh, instead of prayer, this is a moment of compassion. Oh, maybe instead of this being a moment of compassion, this should become a moment of prayer. All because we desire to listen to the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we find ourselves facing situations that require both prayer and compassion. And the Holy Spirit is asking us to lean into one or the other. We need to learn to follow him. And we need to learn to listen to him. Sometimes our effectiveness and compassion is negatively impacted by our underdeveloped underdeveloped prayer life. And sometimes our effectiveness in prayer is negatively impacted by an underdeveloped display of mercy. You and I need the Holy Spirit And as we are going to see next week, we don't just need the discernment of the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Because in that act of compassion, it was the power of God that raised that man up. So we need to know how to operate with the listening to the Holy Spirit. And also we need to know how to let the Holy Spirit move through us in powerful displays. 
if we are people of the Spirit, prayer and compassion will not be adversaries, but they will be allies to us. The vertical relationship with God and the horizontal relationship with others is not supposed to divide us, but it is supposed to draw us together into a holistic relationship. Oh, that we could become like Jesus, people that could go through our days with a confidence, knowing that the Spirit is with us, sensing the rhythm of the Spirit and what might be needed in the moment, that we would be willing to adjust our schedules, our time, our priorities, and our expectations because we have learned and we know how to flow in both prayer and compassion as God is leading us. And we value them both. We value them equally. We are willing to offer both. We are willing to operate in both equally, recognizing that one is not better than the other, but both are necessary parts of the whole. Oh, that we would become that people. As we close this morning, I have two questions for us to consider. Well, first is a question. The second's more of a prompt. What are you most passionate about? What do you lean to, prayer or compassion? What's more in your wheelhouse? Which one tends to be the solution that you gravitate to most when you encounter all situations in life? When you think about other Christians, what frustrates you about them? The fact that they aren't dedicated enough to prayer? Or the fact that they're not dedicated enough to compassion. That might help you understand which one you gravitate to. When you think about Uptown Church, do you think this church really needs to grow more in prayer? Or do you think that this church needs to grow more in its emphasis on compassion? Where do you think that we're weak? These all can be helpful ideas for understanding what your natural leaning and what your natural bent is. And then you have to consider, why am I naturally bent that way? Why am I leaning this way? And why am I divisive about it? Why am I egotistical about it? Why do I demonize others around this? Why do I break relationship and fellowship with people over it? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and and begin to understand what's going on with us. And then the other thing, can you list three ways that you could lean into and develop your lesser preference? And I'm not asking that question to say that we're trying to give equal airtime to both of these things, but we need to be ready to offer both. And some of us, we've become so divided and so divisive over this, and we now recognize maybe and realize that I'm really, really comfortable with prayer because that's really all I do. And I'm awkward with compassion for a number of reasons. Or I'm really, really good at compassion but I really haven't developed anything when it comes to prayer. It's hard for me to pray. It's hard for like, like, well, why is that? And how can we start to develop what we're weaker in so that we're ready to offer it when the time comes? How can we become, it's almost like becoming a switch hitter in baseball. I don't want to just bat from the right side of the plate. I want to be able to bat from the left side of the plate. I don't want to have a dominant, like I want to have a little bit more of a comfortability I get it. We're going to probably be a little bit better in one or gravitate to one. Or I'm, not, I'm not asking for us to like become so equal in it. What I'm saying is that there's something happening where we have neglected one over the other to an extreme. And we have demonized each other over it as well. Would you pray with me this morning? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are being called to the great commandment to love you and to love others. Why have we divided ourselves over this? Forgive us, I pray. Unify us, Lord, I pray. Bring your people together to be a people of prayer and a people of compassion. Make us a people that walk in your spirit, that are sensitive to the voice of the spirit, to the movement of the spirit. And then we operate according to how you lead us and how you guide us. Help us to flow and operate like Jesus. Bringing what needs to be brought 
into the relationships that we have, the situations that we face at work, at home, in our personal life, when we're walking down the street, when we pass people, when we're sitting on the bus, when we're on our commute, anywhere we find ourselves, in a restaurant, you name it. Lord, I pray that we would be arrested by your Holy Spirit at the moment that you are calling us to be agents of the kingdom, whether it be for prayer or for compassion. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.